You're listening to the Journey to Launch podcast, building a media empire, raising millions in capital and achieving financial freedom her own way with Morgan Debon. Okay, Journeyers, I am super excited to have Morgan Debon in the rocket seat. Morgan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I already did your full introduction um, before we officially started this conversation. So people know you from that, but there may be some of my listeners who we call journeyers over here who don't know who you are. And you have an extensive um, resume and receipts on building businesses, raising capital, and just being in an entrepreneur space as someone that, you know, if you're trying to get in and do well, like, you should follow. So I want to kind of just start really briefly with some of the businesses that you've built, acquired, <laughs> which to me is like another level, um, right? Um, what you've done so far. And then I want to get into some money talk with you. So can you just say a little bit about um, your Blavity Inc. and what you've been able to do with that? And just like a quick rundown of what you've done. Yeah, so I started Blavity Inc. Um, seven years ago with my co-founders, Jonathan, Jeff, and Aaron. And we all went to college together. Um, and Blavity is a media company for Black millennials and now Gen Z as they've gotten older and have taken our spot in the 20s. Um, and we create experiences, we create content, we create and build platforms for us. And um, the business owns a variety of brands. So we're, we're basically a portfolio business. So we have um, brands that speak to the lifestyle of Black millennials like travel, so travel noir, um, health and wellness and beauty with 2190 tech, innovation, financial um, literacy, buying cryptocurrency, raising money, that's AfroTech, um, and it goes on and on. And I started the business basically a couple years out of college. I was working in Silicon Valley at the time and then was like, uh-oh, y'all out here really building these things. And no one was building anything for us. And I felt like this was a once in a lifetime opportunity to actually take advantage of the wealth creation happening in the Bay Area and also building a brand that spoke to the issues and the conversations that I cared about and that I felt like many other Black millennials cared about, but maybe hadn't kind of rose to the top of mainstream media. And legacy Black media was very focused, especially seven years ago, on um, entertainment and celebrity and not necessarily on news and issues, which we know is the number one thing that it's driving even the younger generation than us. It's like, they want to know what you think about whatever they're passionate about, right? Like, what do you think about the environment? What do you think about Black Lives Matter? And it's actually at the forefront of their decision-making. Um, and so I wanted to build brands that spoke to that change and movement within the Black community. And you're doing that. And, you know, I love um, for what you wanted to do, you had to think outside the box, but not really. Like you saw that there was a need in our culture for just uh, a variety of topics that we could relate to and talk to. Because like you said, even I even see it in podcasting. So I know you have a podcast, um, the Work Smart podcast, but I find that a lot of the mainstream, like mainstream popular black podcasts are more entertainment based, but there are so many like black podcasters talking more about just entertainment, right? Like money, entrepreneurship. And, you know, so I think it's really important to create brands and it be authentic to what we want to hear. So you, you, you're doing that still with Blavity. So I want to know like also about just um, thinking outside the box too and growing it to the capacity that you have to raise capital, right? Because like as an entrepreneur right now, myself, I'm self-funding everything. So, you know, there's no outside capital. I don't know if I want to go that route, but a lot of us kind of like, it's more, not only can we not get capital maybe, but what does that look like for you in terms of encouraging people to think bigger than maybe just being a solo entrepreneur or freelancer? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I, I work on a lot in terms of advising entrepreneurs on how to scale their business and raising venture funding isn't for everybody. So, you know, I've raised a little under 13 million, so about 12.8, I think, and I did that over three to four years. Um, the reason I raised money was because the vision that I have and the vision and mission that we set out to, to create requires a influx of capital so we could move quickly. 
I could have built what I built, but it would have taken much longer if I hadn't raised venture capital. It gave me the wiggle room to do things like make acquisitions. It gave me the wiggle room to hire executives that cost way more than I could ever have imagined spending on, on, a, on a person. Um, and it also gave me the wiggle room to build a company in a corporate culture that could attract the best talent. So thinking about having 401ks, everybody gets equity in the business if they're a full-time employee, you know, health insurance, and, and really building a business and a company, which is different than building a lifestyle business. And I have a lifestyle business on, on the side, I run a company called Debon & Co, which is my business that runs the WorkSmart program, the WorkSmart podcast, which you all should go and subscribe to, um, and also does any like brand deals that I work on our consulting when I do advisorship with other companies and businesses. And so that, I will never raise venture funding for that because it's not designed to be at scale. That doesn't mean we're not profitable and I'm, I'm, you know, we're not taking home a ton of money every year. It just means that the business growth plan does not require outside capital because then I have to give up equity and I don't want to do that. And when you give up equity in a, in a business, you're also oftentimes required or should be required to give a return on that investment. And so when someone gives you a dollar in Silicon Valley, they expect $10 back in five to seven years. And if your business doesn't have a plan for that, or that doesn't seem realistic for the type of business you're starting, the category, or how much how much hard work you want to put into it, if it doesn't meet your lifestyle goals, then you probably shouldn't raise venture funding. So if someone gives you a million dollars, they want 10 million back in five to seven years. That's it. Or else they're going to start knocking on your door. Um, all right. Well, so I love that you brought that up. Like who should consider or not? Like we've seen the whole we work um, fiasco play out. And I mean, apart from not under knowing really the motivations behind everyone, you can you, you you can see or tell from the documentaries and just from the talk that a lot of that um, was like trying to live up to the expectations of returning capital and growing at a fast rate to um, basically grow this company and at scale, right? In a way that was not sustainable um, to the exact business, like the underlying principles weren't there. So I find that um, even like in my case, so recently, and this wasn't like a big thing, but someone reached out and was like, oh, we can invest like per percentage of equity to help you and to envision what Journey to Launch can be that can go to hiring, um, development of projects. And in my head, I'm just like, well, I've actually never thought about accepting any type of investment, right? Like I was, I'm okay with kind of going the slow, Pay, so that way I'm making sure it's sustainable. And so for someone like myself, right, it's like more of like a, a media company per se, there are some other aspects to it. Like, what would you say, um, am I thinking too small by not, you know, saying, hey, why not go big and think about, you know, production and the TV, um, things you can do and develop versus, you know what, steady and slow, you don't want to turn out like <laughs> said company that can't sustain what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, so many media businesses go under, most media businesses go out of business. It's very difficult to grow a media business. And I think times have also changed. So I don't know that anyone could try to look at my pathway and try to duplicate it today because the world has changed and technology has changed and it's a creator-driven economy. In other words, it's about the brand of the person and not necessarily the brand of the entity moving forward. So you know, I think for you, you have two separate businesses. You have you, the person, the personal brand, right? And then you have you, your business, which has the brand that's public facing for your podcast, for your programs, et cetera, right? And both are media companies, right? And both can be monetized in different ways. And my recommendation generally for any entrepreneur or creator, really truly a creator, someone with something to say, someone who has some value that they're providing to a community of people is to find your super fans. Find those a thousand people who are gonna like mess with you no matter what you drop. They're gonna download the podcast. They're gonna sign up for the newsletter. They're gonna subscribe on Patreon and figure out how to super serve those people. And then once you're successful at that, then add another group of people that you're super serving. I don't think that um, there's anything wrong with the vision being to really get specific. And at the time when I was starting Blavity, I was being specific in a way that people thought I was um, too specific. You know, saying black millennials, people were just accepting millennials as a, as a demographic, right? And when I say people, I mean like, you know, the white people in power that give out the money, right? right? right. Um, they're like, you're going to already 
millennials are what percent of the population? This is how our conversations. Millennials are what percent of the population? And I would give them the number. And they say, okay, and black millennials are what percentage of the millennial population? And I would give them the numbers. And like, so you're going to start off with this total market, right? So they already thought that I was being small. And I was like, cool, you keep thinking that and you can pass on this investment and that's fine because because I know I know that this is big and universal. Um, and so you have to also believe that starting small is can be your competitive advantage to not getting distracted and not trying to serve everybody and then result in serving nobody. Right. And you proved your concept um, before you went to try to raise capital. Right. So you knew that you had something there. So, okay, we talked about, um, you know, uh, millions that you've raised for your companies, you acquired a, a, a couple companies too. And I want to talk about just also how the optics of that for people who like are not in your real life, right? So someone can look at you and your brand and be like, wow, she like must have a lot of money, right? Um, or she is personally wealthy. And I do want to talk about like that, that um, the separation between like your business wealth and income and raising capital versus like personal wealth because this podcast like what I talk about is financial independence and so the levers to that are building a business entrepreneurship working in a job right you can still work in a job and build wealth maybe the slower way but with that comes what do you do with that money that you get now like personally to build actual wealth where you're not on a treadmill having to continue to raise capital, work for someone else if you don't want to. So can we explore that side of you in terms of that transition between raising millions and then where is Morgan at like in terms of her financial independence journey? Yeah, you know, starting a business is actually a bit of a financial hit, especially when you quit your job. So when I started my business, I was working full time and then investing any like basically extra income outside of my expenses in the business itself. And I did that for over a year because I wanted to bootstrap the business for the first year without taking outside, which means not taking outside investors. And so I had to be very financially disciplined um, for the first four or five years of, of growing Blavity. And that included even when I started Blavity and quit my job eventually, I then took a consulting contract on the side so that I could not take a salary in the business and then reinvest you know, every single dollar that we were making back into my employees, into hiring people. And even when we raised money, I took a very, I don't even think I took a salary. I, I like paid for our, my housing. Um, and so, you know, I had already raised maybe a million dollars um, and hadn't taken a salary yet. Uh, which is really bad for my taxes. The IRS is still coming after me because it's very complicated. Um, but then, you know, I, I gave myself a real salary during my Series A, which was only in 2018. Um, and now I, I think that I am more conservative than a lot of venture-backed companies. And I have right reasons to be conservative because I'm a Black woman building a company for Black people run by majority people of color. And it wasn't necessarily guaranteed that the capital markets were going to continue to invest in us. And so I wanted to make the money that I did raise last as long as possible and build sustainable business models so that we could be cash flow positive eventually and not have to depend on venture capital to be able to grow and invest in new projects and new things. So it was painful though, right? I mean, to your point, if you had looked at the headlines, you might say, oh, wow, like her company's valued over $10 million. This is, you know, a while ago, we're way bigger than that now, but it's like, oh, you know, well, she must be worth $5 million. And it's like, I mean, I'm rich on paper, uh, but I can't cash this equity, right? The only way that you liquidate, like liquid, that's the key word when it comes to, um, being having some wealth is it's not just the assets that you own, but also what is your liquid uh, flexibility, because then you can actually pull equity out of the business and turn it into a house, turn it into stocks and crypto, turn it into art investments and things that will appreciate and diversifying your assets. So I have started to do that now. Um, but I also, full disclosure on the personal side, I have been investing in the stock market since I was 13. So I was an early investor in lots of stocks. And so I used, I, I didn't have a lot of capital when I first started investing or else I would be probably not even working right now uh, <laughs> with the returns that I've had. But I was able to use that initial um, money as a safety net 
mentally so that I could quit my job. So it's like push comes to shove, I can sell my Facebook stock, right? And also I did use some of the money to invest in Blavity so we could grow faster without bootstrapping, uh, without raising money while we were bootstrapping. Um, And so I do think it's important for anyone listening right now to start to learn about the stock market it's a great way to get passive income um, if you do dividend-based stocks and you reinvest your dividends over time and the compounding interest and in time that you were, were so young, the younger you start, the better, you know, and don't try to pick stocks, start off in mutual funds, start off in, you know, ETFs, et cetera, um, but you don't have to try to pick one or two winners or else you probably are going to pick wrong. It's very difficult to time the market. Yes, yes. And okay, so you just dropped, um, I feel like some, some nuggets here or some things that I feel like we should explore. So 13, you're already investing in the stock market. So how did you know to do that? Did you get taught that by your parents? Was it some internal kind of curiosity that you saw a news um, you know, headline and did it? Because as a parent myself, I mean, I know this and I'm going to teach my kids this, but I just love when I hear people talk about what they did when they were really young. Because I'm like, okay, how did you, how did that happen? Because I want my kids to be, have interest and self um, motivation to want to do things like that too. So what was that for you? Um, I come from a family like ancestry of, of black families that always prioritized ownership and equity and stocks and um, owning things like houses and, and things of that nature. And we weren't rich growing up. We were middle class and my grandparents were all working class teachers um, and um, factory workers. And so Yet we lived a rich life, you know, like I never felt like money was a thing. I wore goodwill. I didn't care, you know, and yet my dad and my mom wanted to really make sure that I could be financially independent. Um, And they really raised me as like a strong woman and someone who they wanted to make sure that as I was growing up, that I never felt dependent on a man for my freedom um, financially. And so I think that they were very intentional about me learning about business, learning about stock market at a young age. Um, The game that we used to play, my dad would match whatever money I would put into the stock market. So let's say, you know, every year my grandma gave me a hundred dollars, you know, no matter what it was, it was always a hundred dollar check. And the rule was you can spend 50% on whatever you want. Like bubble gum money is what we used to call it. If you want to go and spend $50 on bubble gum, have at it. And then it was, or um, but you have to you have to save the other fifty percent. So you have to save the other fifty percent, or if you invest the other fifty percent, we will then match it. So Grandma gives me a hundred, and I put in a fifty into the stock market. I actually get another fifty, right? So I got one hundred and fifty from Grandma, basically from Grandma and my parents. And I I could do that math, but you know I I was like oh that's lit. Right. And so that's, that was the motivator for me. Basically, my parents could basically pay me. I think I like peed in the bed till I was three. And then at one point they're like, we'll pay you a quarter every time you don't be in the bed done gone. I was collecting those quarters. So I've always been motivated uh, by transactions and returns on investments. Yeah, that's fascinating and great. I mean, um, it's, and the other thing you said, which is really important, you said you had a um, mental safety net And I find that like people, like, you know, even if it's illiquid in certain ways, like, you know, it's harder to like cash in, even if it's like a house um, where you have equity in or, you know, um, just other things like stocks where you're necessarily, if you did get into a bind, that's the last thing you want to really sell. But the fact that you know that you have it gives you a level of confidence um, that is really important that, you know, if you don't have that, you, you most likely won't take the risks. So yeah. One of the things that you said, and I was saying, okay, so if you weren't paying yourself really until 2018, like how did you sustain your like life? Like where were the personal finance decisions that you had to make to get to be okay? Well, Blavity was my life. So mm-hmm. what I would challenge is, well, what, what expenses do I have? Um, and I focused on that. So housing, okay, well, I lived in the office. The office was my apartment. Right. Um, literally, we had a studio, uh, two apartments. One was the office, the other one was my bedroom. Um okay, what am I eating? Well, frankly, anytime I'm eating, I'm working. So I had some groceries, but a lot of it was business expenses. Um, I had no car. I paid for my, you know, my cell phone bill. Um, But I wasn't like on vacation. I think a lot of people just take it too much. I wasn't going on vacation. You wasn't going to see me in the club. You weren't going to see me running around with red bottoms. Like, 
No, that was not my focus. And uh, most of you have never met me. And, or if you have, it's been in the last two to three years. Why? Because I was not trying to be out here. I was working. It wasn't a Morgan show. It was a build the business time frame and building the business required for me to have my head down, you know, and that was really critical to the foundation of Blavity and the culture that we built at the company of being a company of, of people who work hard and people who um, care about the work itself and not necessarily the ego of being a part of this cool, you know, sexy black startup. Yeah. And, you know, ego and people doing things, um, putting the cart before the horse per se, because I feel like now in our world, um, like people will see you and right now they're like, well, I want to be that. And so they'll start the buying or the, the flexing earlier than they should without the foundation. Um, and I, it's very appealing. Like, you know, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm old, I'm in my like, I'm an older millennial myself, and but I have younger siblings and just people in my life where they want to flex um, already before the work is done because they because the message is you deserve it. Um, and I get it like, you know, like black women, like you need to you know treat yourself and all these things, which I understand. But I also feel like um, in a day and age where people are like, well, you need to pay yourself pay yourself first. And I get it. But I, I just feel like everyone that I've spoken to, including my own story that has made something like they actually, there was some sacrifice up front. Like it was not pretty, <laughs> like it was work. Yeah, completely. And I also think that youth was on my side. One of the reasons I started the business at 24 was because I knew that 33 year old me is not you know, going to be in the mud as much as 23 year old me, <laughs> right? Um, you know, by the time I'm 35, I might be married with kids. I'm not going to be up all night. I want to look good. I want to get my hair done. I want to spend money on things. Um, and that was a lifestyle choice that I made. Other people start their businesses later after they've already had children or after they've already gotten married or they've they wanted to make sure that they could pay off their student loans. So they kept that corporate job a little bit longer. But also now your quality of life and your golden handcuffs are much, much stronger because you're used to spending a ton of money. You live in a house or you live in an apartment that's not cheap. You know, I had three roommates when I first started the company, right? So that's tough. That means that you got to be making a lot more money just to break even. Mm -hmm. And your mindset, like you said, you're already fixed into this mindset. It's more rigid. It can be more rigid. I want and you have more out. to lose. Yeah. If you mess up, you lose a lot more because you have a lot more. I and messed up. I, the worst that was going to happen to me was I was moving in my parents' basement. That was the worst thing that could happen to me at that point in my life. Right, right. And it's so interesting to think back. And for people like you listening right now, um, you may be in that position. Maybe you are. That's why I say if you are in your early 20s with not a lot of responsibilities, like right now, no kids, no mortgage, like now is the time to take risks and go for it. OK, <laughs> but do it for the rest of us. Yes, but I do. I don't want to discourage, you know, the later the late bloomers or the, you know, um, just people who are in their 30s, 40s, who got the mortgage already, who have the kids like you are. Your life is not over. OK, like, no, but I would recommend something. I would recommend instead of quitting, figuring out how you can reduce your expenses, get more cash flow from your income, from your corporate job or from your husband's corporate job or whatever your finances are so that you can invest in the business. You don't have to be full time in your business necessarily to have a strong business. And also you could use that money to hire someone else who's full time or someone else who's part time while you still have your corporate gig. There's just a, it's just a different mindset, but it's all about how much money at the end of the day do you have to invest Yes. Yes. Okay. So in terms of, and so one of your posts I was um, referring to before we started recording, which I really loved um, on your personal Instagram, you talked about buying a house and how one, like the process for buying a house as an entrepreneur, you kind of alluded to that, like with the IRS, like it was not easy. So can you talk about that process? Like, um, you know, that you did get the house, but what that was like for you to have to prove, you know, income as an entrepreneur. Yeah, buying a house is tough, I think, for everybody. Um, so being a first-time home owner and also um, being an entrepreneur who's full-time in my business at this point, it was difficult because I didn't know that they were going to look at my business finances and take that in consideration for my kind of like debt to credit um, or my debt to, to income ratio. And so I felt like what do you need to know about Blavity's revenue? Like this has nothing to do with me. We've been in business for seven years, but because I still own a large equity stake, it is actually a factor in the risk profile of me. 
And because we're a venture backed business, it's very difficult for mortgage um, bankers and underwriters to understand me. They don't see that every day, especially not in Nashville, um, which is where I live now. And so there was a lot of negotiation back and forth. There was a lot of frustrated moments where I kind of was like, you don't get me. This is racist. And I'm like, it's not racist. It's just difficult, you know? And um, yeah, it was very vulnerable time period for me, very stressful. And I'm also doing it alone. Like I'm not married. So there's not like, you know, I have someone else's income that is very stable that has a corporate job for 15 years that they can look at their stuff and say, oh, whatever, we'll just use his as the profile. It was really just me. And so if it didn't work out, then, um, you know, I wasn't going to be able to get the house that I wanted. And I was unwilling to accept that. You know, I've worked very hard. I've been very conservative. And I also... Um, felt like the house. I was like, I can afford this. Like my paycheck can, can get this house. Right. But it wasn't about my income. It was about the full profile of including Blavity, which again, venture back startups, we're not turning a profit every year. Why would you do that? That's not the point. Right. So if you look four years back, you're gonna be like, whoa, you were spending a lot, millions and millions of dollars. I'm like, duh, that's what we're supposed to do. So it was very difficult to explain that stay level-headed because they still held the power so that I could get the mortgage. Um, and I just didn't know. I didn't know anything. <laughs> so yeah. I was learning in the moment and I didn't know what was normal versus just person felt what felt personal was actually normal. And so it was, it was a tough time period for me, but ultimately, you know, we're recording this in my, my new house with no furniture because everything is back ordered because of COVID. Um, and, and I'm really grateful to have gone through the experience and now to be able to share it with other people who um, may be going through the same thing or thinking about it. And so my tips for someone who is an entrepreneur who's full time. Right. One is to make sure that you pay yourself. Um, even because they're going to look at your income over time and because I wasn't paying myself early on in the business, it looked like I had no like stable income. And it was like, well, why couldn't the business afford to pay you? Um, so that was tough. And I know that goes counterintuitive to the entire conversation we just had, but this would be my advice for people who want to buy houses. And there's other ways you can probably do the, the owner's draw. There's different types of ways that you pay yourself. Um, so that's, that's one thing because you need to show your W-2s over time. And then the second is, um, you know, it is likely that you're going to have to pay your full 20% down. And so make sure that you have that ready. It's not like you're going to get a uh, crazy great terms as an entrepreneur. You're not a doctor. You're not a lawyer. You know, they're, they're not going to necessarily believe that you have a lot of earning potential over time. They're also, they don't care about your net worth on paper, mm. right? So they don't care that I'm worth a lot of money on paper. They don't care because it's not liquid and it could change. The business could go under and then what, right? From their perspective, Blavity is not going anywhere, but they right. don't, be, you know, that's they where we have that. to have. They, they, they don't know that. Like, we don't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't know that. And we don't care. And we can't put that in our little calculator. So we have to assume that if the business goes under, you have no income and you're not worth anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And I'm like, Ooh, talk about an ego hit. So, so that's the second thing. And then the third thing is, um, your credit score. So I wasn't paying attention to my credit score because I didn't really need credit and I didn't have a car and I, I don't have any debt. And um, I use credit cards very conservatively. I mostly pay for things in cash or I use a debit card. So I wasn't paying attention to my credit score. And then I looked at it and said, uh oh, I need to work on my credit, which was the easy thing to fix. I just wasn't paying attention to it. And because my credit was sub 700, it also added another layer of them not necessarily giving me the benefit of the doubt. Now I got my credit score up to 740 plus in less than like two and a half months because it was easy stuff to adjust and fix. Okay. So but, I have to ask you because someone's listening like, wait, how did you do that? Cause they're like, maybe thinking about their credit score. <laughs> sure. But also to, I don't have any debt. So it's easy to then okay. show, you know, yeah. so you know, I call my credit cards, got more credit under my name. Um, right. I added a secured credit card, you know, so that it, it was all about just increasing the total number amount of credit under my name. Yep. I then called and added like 
my cell phone bills and some bills that I had been paying for over a long period of time so that my credit profile showed a longer time with credit cards. Cause again, I didn't have that many and I had just maybe started in my twenties. So it's not like I had a credit card for 25 years or whatever. Um, and then there were some credit, like I had a TJ Maxx card straight out of undergrad and the T they canceled the TJ Maxx card because they actually just canceled the card like type itself, but it showed off as a, it showed up as like a canceled account. Right. So when you have these dings and you don't have a lot of credit, it has a disproportionate amount of impact on your score. And so I went and kind of did all of the contesting of, of all the things. I'm like, this was 15 years ago or 12 years ago. You should drop this off, which then everybody did. And so boom, 740 plus, right? Um, you just got to do the work. You got to follow all the things. My girl, Tiffany Budgenista was like, yes. what are we doing? Okay. <laughs> what do I need to do? And right. I did all the things and it, and it works because they weren't real. It wasn't real stuff. You know, it was just BS credit bureaucracy basically yeah but those are good tips I mean you just gave tips on just for entrepreneurs what to and even if you're not an entrepreneur like to prepare for buying a house like you pay attention to your credit right um if you're not already you know uh make sure you have the down payment the necessary down payment and the income part of it like you said like it's nuanced this like first of all success to me it's a cliche word but you know, no one rule to me works in every scenario. And you as the leader, the, the person driving your car, manning your ship, like you have to decide when to deploy what option that's gonna work in what scenario. And sometimes it's not like black and white, it's very gray, um, especially just as an entrepreneur, figuring out what works when and why. So I love that you shared that, so thank you. Um, one of the other things you mentioned uh, is that like you're now house hacking. So you're not, <laughs> so, and I just, first of all, I just, again, I love like showing that, you know, even though on paper you're rich, now you're paying yourself and you, you were able to afford it yourself a lifestyle um, that you bought this house and you can say the story, but you intended to live in the bigger part, like what you want, the, the part you wanted to and tell everyone kind of your thought process into switching into doing something different. Yeah. So I actually wound up not doing it, but I'll tell you okay. all the, the story. So um, after I bought the house and I gave them my ridiculous down payment and then got all the fees and got the quotes for drapes for $15,000 and just crazy, the crazy cost of setting up a brand new, it was a new build house. So it was like, we didn't have any window treatments, you know, like I got to do landscaping, like I get a tree, like, you know, so once you go through it, I'm like, oh, that was a lot of zeros out the bank account. Right. And so I was like, I'm feeling very poor, cash poor, which I don't like as someone who's worked very hard to be financially secure. And so I was complaining to my mom, um, I was like, mom, the furniture, like, this is a lot, this is a lot going on. And, uh, she was like, well, and I also bought my first rental property. So the house is a house that has a main house plus an apartment, a full one bedroom, one bath. It's got its own washer dryer, its own kitchen, its own entrance and everything. Um, cause I, my intention was to rent that out. Cause you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I could never just buy a house. You know, I got to buy the house with the rental property attached. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, uh, I don't know. And then, so I was starting to do the research on the rent for the rental unit, the one bedroom. And she was like, well, why don't you rent out the full house and you live in the apartment? And I said, what? I have never considered that all these little fake tears. I was crying and stress. I did my brain would my brain could not even consider that I would let some random family live in my big part of my house that I just bought to offset the cost. Cause the, the rent would have been, you know, two X the mortgage mortgage um, because of the rates right now. And for this side of the house and, um, I just couldn't even conceptualize that. Like my brain wouldn't even let me brainstorm there because okay. it's so contrary to my ego. That's what I was going to ask you. Is it because, you know, you're a smart woman and like, is it more of your ego? It was ego like that was blinding in that decision or you just couldn't see it. Cause I know there are people right now who are in situations where like, this is my life. I can't like, this is my situation. And it's like done. And it's like, there's an opportunity right in front of you that you just cannot see yet. So, completely. Okay. Yeah. I was like, I worked very hard for this walk-in closet. How dare you suggest I give it away mm. before I even get to use it? <laughs> so, 
So yeah, it was definitely ego. But it's valid. Um, it's valid. That's not even a knit. Like to me, that's normal. Like, why wouldn't you feel that way? Like you bought it so you could, that was what you wanted to do. Okay. Yeah. But, um, but I was, but I was also very frustrated and felt annoyed by the cash flow situation. So it's like, which one is bigger, right? Which one was the more priority? And so ultimately what I've done is I haven't moved it into the apartment or I live in the main house. Um, but I then said to myself, okay, this is actually really awesome because if I ever want to buy another house or if I ever want to leave, I don't need to sell this house. I can just rent out the main stuff, move my, my stuff to the apartment. And it just gave me more freedom to think through, okay, this house as an asset um, and, you know, as I grow, as, as the business continues to grow, you know, I may wind up in condo, want to spend a couple years in another city. Right. But now my brain is like, oh yes, that's fine. You are not locked into any location because you can always rent out the main house. That's going to pay for the mortgage and then some, which can always fund your lifestyle in another city, or it can be money that you invest in another property. Um, and so it is a really freeing point of view. And then the second thing is, um, because I chose to not rent out the main house, I did, I often make negotiations with myself, which is if you're going to leave money on the table, how are you going to make money in a different way to offset the money you left on the table? It's like a weird mind trick that I play with myself, right? It's like when you're like, oh, I want to buy this shoe. Okay. Well, if you want to buy the shoe, then you got to do this workout, right? Like I make that transaction. So I then put, um, I delayed buying some furniture and I spent, some of my more recent, most recent salary in and put it back in the stock market. So instead of taking some of the liquidation that I had, I put it back into the market because the idea is, you know, the market's going to continue to grow. That's going to offset the total worth, you know, deficit that I'm taking by not renting out the house. And that made me feel better at least. Yeah. But that is actually a good consideration for anyone like thinking of, okay, if I'm going to take this thing and maybe it's more expensive or it's going to be more out of pocket, what am I going to do to replenish that on the other end to make me feel better about this situation? And then the other thing I just wanted to highlight was, you know, it's even good just to do the exercise. So you didn't go through yet with it, but now that you've considered it, you now have a wide option. Like your brain has now considered not just that as an option to run out the main house, but there's other things that have come from that. So if you are listening and, you know, I would say, let your ego, like, Think about the things your ego does not want you to think about because I've been there. I'm still there in some ways, but I'm just like, I don't even want to think of that like thing, but think it through. It doesn't mean you have to do it just because you think it doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? Like you're thinking it through and you're planning out things because maybe that's not the thing, but the next thought that it leads to and leads to is what is opening up your mind for expansion. <laughs> exactly. Exactly that. So, all right. Um, so now you are, so the other thing question, I'm just being now nosy here. Um, Nashville, why Nashville when, you know, your tech person why not on one of the coasts where you know all the, where everything's happening yeah well I used to live in San Francisco I started mm -hmm. the business in San Francisco I lived there for four years and then I moved to LA and lived, lived there since um until January <laughs> and mm -hmm. of 2021 um my parents live here in Nashville and they lived here for seven plus years I'm from St. Louis originally so I'm a Midwest southern girl at heart um, if you had asked me like 18 year old me where I was living, I would have said, I got a big ass house on Lindell in the middle of St. Louis. I am the mayor. Like I am never leaving 314 to the day I die. Okay. No. Yeah. Jamie, that's my life. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's always been important to me to stay grounded and to stay humble and to be, um, closer to my family. And, you know, because of COVID, that was very clear to me, the absence of family in my life and how that impacted me because of not being able to travel and see them. Um, my brother and his wife just had a baby. And so, and they're moving closer to, to the South. They live in Seattle right now. Um, so for me, it's just a better balance. It's a better balance on the day-to-day. -day. And when I think about joy and happiness, I think about how can I incrementally improve my happiness on a day-to-day -day basis. There's nothing that makes me happier than my dad being like, hey, I'm outside. You know, what are we eating for dinner, right? Or my mom being like, hey, do you need anything from Costco? I don't take that for granted because I didn't have that. I was really out here in California on my own, um, which I know so many people do. And it's just part of the dream of, you know, going into Silicon Valley or moving to for Hollywood. And yet 
I was at a point in my career where I could make that decision to, to be closer to home as my home base. Now I was just in LA for two weeks now. So I'm going to be back and forth and doing my thing and, and thought and bopping just like everybody else. But at least my home is uh, grounded in my family and accessibility. And it doesn't hurt that Tennessee has no state income tax. Yeah, just, right. <laughs> pushed me over the edge. And your money could go a lot. Well, I mean, I'm further, right? And buying. Something. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, smart. you know, California, more importantly, has the highest state income tax, I think, between California and New York. So 13%. So that means every single week, I'm making 13% more just existing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my tax person said, he was like, well, you know, this, this, like you're getting double tax, especially because of the entity that I currently am. Like, you know, if you move from New York, you won't have this tax. I'm like, all right, well that, I don't know. Well, maybe. Right. But I'd love that you're, you're thinking about what, what lifestyle do I want to live today? Um, that I, and family is important, right? That's like a form of wealth. Like that fact that you have this uh, community that's family community around you, um, you can't necessarily measure how that also impacts the way you work and <laughs> how you bring in, you know, income to your, your different businesses. So I love that. Um, so tell us in general now, like where you are, what's next for Morgan and Blavity? What are some of the exciting projects that you're working on that we should know about? Yeah, so Blavity is growing like crazy. All of our brands are doing incredibly well. Um, coming up, we have Summit 21, which is our women's conference for entrepreneurs, hustlers, people who are aspiring to live an incredible life. So that's free. So you guys can check that out at summit21.com or on 2190.com. Um, so I'm really excited for that. And traveling again, you know, Travel Noir is up and running and it had a rough year, um, although people were doing a lot of domestic travel. So that content increased quite a bit, but I think everyone's planning their getaway. And so Travel Noir, we just released a new website. So you can like type in Tulum and you'll get all the places to stay, all the black owned restaurants, every single thing. So we just did this huge new kind of like data infrastructure for Travel Noir to make it easier for people. Um, so I'm super excited to get back on the road. And then let's see what else. My podcast, I've been loving talking more instead of just like the fleeting Instagram story. You know, there's something about podcasts where you can actually have a conversation, get into the weeds, tell the story and explain. And it's not just these little sound bites, you know, so I'm really enjoying the Work Smart podcast and helping people scale their businesses and think up through some of this financial stuff of like hiring your first team member. What does that look like? How much do you pay them? Or what is an organizational chart? Why should you have one? Or, okay, you want to get into the stock market. Here's how I did it. So, um, it's been a really fun experience, but we, the podcasting business is very, very different. It's, yeah, it's another, it's another, it's another level of, um, it's so particular and the people who listen and how it spreads and grows. It's really interesting. Completely different. So I'm learning a ton and it's kicking my butt, but I'm having a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. And well, so the other thing that I was going to just like, as, as you, as it came up, as you were talking about the events and the businesses and what's going on, I'm like, obviously you have a team. You're hiring people. You have people who are competent and invested in the success. Um, so one, I need to listen to whatever episode you had on hiring teams, because I feel like that's my next level of act is actually hiring people to help get things off my plate. But what would you say then for um, someone who's at this level who wants to who wants to do more? Maybe not necessarily be the next Morgan, but the, the they want to step in more into what they can do and be the visionary, the CEO, and not necessarily be all always in the business what would be some of the things that you would just like as a takeaway tell them to do right now? Yeah, so one of the methods I teach in the WorkSmart program, it's the first thing that I have everybody to do is that you have to start with you. Like you have to start with mastering your own time and you have to understand what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I do this exercise, I'll give it to you all now. You make a list of all the tasks that you do on a weekly basis and a daily basis. And then you separate those tasks into your operating tasks, which are tasks that you just, somebody somewhere has got to do it, right? It's sending out invoices, it's posting on Instagram, it's coming up with content ideas, it's right, it's just the nitty gritty of the day to day. And then you come up with your task and you move task over into your CEO task, which are tasks only you can do. Only you can set the vision. Only you can maybe close that sales deal, which I'd argue is probably an operating task because you could hire a salesperson, but let's just play this game, yeah. right? There's certain things that like for me, only I can come up with the vision of what Afrotech is in five years from now, right? Only I can decide if Blavity Inc. is going to move into long form content and start to make TV shows and documentaries and things. 
only I can decide if we're going to come back into the office and be remote or go back into the office. There's certain things that only I can decide and only I have the, it's part of my responsibility as the CEO. So once you make those two lists, what will likely happen is you'll see that there's a ton of things that are in your operating tasks. And then you start to group them into, well, what kind of person could do these different types of tasks? So like maybe you need a bookkeeper or an accountant because you don't really enjoy that. And you don't really enjoy sending out your invoices and you could probably get somebody else to do that. And then the question is, what do you do when you replace those tasks? Well, you go and you do more CEO tasks that are tied to revenue so that you're not losing money, right? So your CEO tasks should offset the cost of delegating and hiring some of those buckets in your operating tasks. But the first thing is self-awareness and understanding where, where you're starting from. And I go into all this all the time in the podcast, but that's just a little bit of a preview. Yes, love it. And um, just gave a great exercise for everyone to do. Um, I'm already thinking of, yeah, I know my um, some of the things I need to do this needs to get off my plate. I just need to find the people to do it um, and pay them well so that they're motivated to do it. Um, so again, Morgan, thank you so much. Just final thing, tell everyone where they can catch up with you or follow your work. Yeah, so you can find me on the Work Smart podcast, anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can also follow me on Instagram. I give a very unfiltered behind the scenes of my life, whether that's my Peloton or my flexitarian diet or my mom, whatever it is. Um, and that's just at Morgan Debon. And then Blavity, you can learn more about the company at Blavity Inc., Dot com and that'll show you all of our brands and um, get you to where you want to go. Love it. Thanks so much, Morgan, for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.